Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child through the method of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mackie Lozano. Today, we welcome back Anna Hurdle and Lynn Worthington on the podcast to continue our discussion about welcoming the second plane child. So today's conversation, we really dive into those first few atrium sessions of the year, how to welcome them well, setting up the environment well for them, including the parents and many more important things to consider as we are beginning our year in the level two and level three atrium. I hope you enjoy. Anna and Lynn, welcome back to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. I'm excited to continue our conversation that we started in the last episode, just kind of exploring who the second plane child is, especially as we are gearing up for this next year in the atrium, to kind of explore with you how do we welcome the level two and the level three child? What do those first few weeks look like? And how can we prepare ourselves as the adults to really do this well? I know that we really talk about the level one child a lot. So spending these couple episodes really exploring who this level two and level three child is, I think is really important. So thank you both for sharing your wisdom with us. Lynn, I think that you have a quote that you wanted to share from the religious potential of the child for the 6 to 12 year old to get us started. Is that right? Yes, it is. And I like the way you introduce this, uh, not just as the way we are preparing the atrium, but the way we are preparing ourselves to meet these children in the second plane. And in the introduction to a religious potential to Sophia says, like the younger child, the older child has the capacity to grasp the mystery in its essentiality and to move within the world of mystery with ease and spontaneity. The vital need for essentiality is no less strong for the older child than it is the younger child. The response of the older child differs from that of the younger child as to its rhythm. The pace quickens. And I think as we prepare ourselves uh, to greet the children, this idea of remaining on the level of essentiality, we we are tempted because they are so full of themselves in some (laughs) ways. We're tempted to want to just start throwing things at them and hoping something sticks. Right. But the reality is that they want, they need, and they are capable of going into these mysteries, these essential mysteries in a deep way, uh, in the same way the young children are, we just have to bring it to them in a slightly different way. Yes. I like how in the quote, it talked about the pace quickens, because I think that's, we talked about in the last episode too, but I think that's a shock factor for us as catechists, whenever we go from the peaceful level one atrium to the level two, that the pace is quicker, there's more going on, it's louder, it's supposed to be that way. Yes, and that is disconcerting (laughs) when you have been with level one at where they don't really do, they don't really work collaboratively so much. And now there's this constant back and forth and interaction and you're not always sure, is this productive? Mm -hmm. Is Is this the way it's supposed to be? But it really is. You're right. Yeah. So how do we welcome this child, this second and third level child, the second plane child? How do we welcome them into the atrium at the uh, beginning of the year? And we, we talked a lot last session about how when we prepared the environment, we wanted the children when they walked in, we wanted them to be able to see some familiar friends some familiar materials on the shelves. But at the same time, we wanted them to see new things, something totally new for this new child that Montessori referred to, the second plain child, as the new child. So there is quite a bit of carryover in preparing the environment and then welcoming the child into the space. And as Lynn mentioned, and and you too, Carrie, that that part of that prepared environment includes the adult Mm -hmm. 
and preparing ourselves and then staying prepared as we welcome the children. I think when I when I think about our preparation for receiving the children uh, at the one of the things that always comes to my mind is tend to the human tendencies. You know, keep in mind their need for orientation, their need for exploration, uh, their need for communication. Keep those human tendencies in mind and Think about how am I offering them opportunities to follow those human tendencies, even in this very first moment of walking into the room. Yeah. So how would you do that? What does that look like? Anna? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, the human tendency that comes to mind for me is the first one is orientation. Yeah. So we want to help the child orient to especially those brand new ones the youngest ones, uh, whether it's in level two or level three, orient to the new space. What is that going to look like? Because we know we have to give them time and space to do that. They will seek to do it anyway, because they need to. And of course, movement as well. I would think about that. You know, how are the children going to move and, and so forth? Let's see, the other human tendency toward order, you know, trying to figure out what is, what's the deal here? You know, what's it going to be like? What am I supposed to do? Because the second plane child, as we've talked about before, is in, you know, they're moving into this social plane and at the same time, this moral plane with this huge sense of right and wrong. They want to fit in. They want to come in and and be in this space, and and you know they're just having this internal dialogue in trying to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the ways that I have found that both helps me in sort of knowing where they are, but also helps them is that sometimes even before we come into this space. We need a little get to know you time, mm -hmm. especially if there are new children and, and the returning children can be really helpful here. But just to have everybody maybe say their name, if they don't all go to the same school, where do they go to school? Uh, my favorite question is, what is your favorite thing to do except for coming to the atrium? I know that's your favorite. <laughs> But what else? What other favorite thing do you have? And when I give them a little chance to just kind of get to know each other that way, what they find out is that there's somebody else who really loves to play soccer. There's somebody else who really who's taking violin. There's somebody else who goes to their school, but maybe they haven't met them. It immediately gives them a little bit of a social context and makes this place seem I want to say more like what they know. For those who are returning, this is kind of an opportunity for them also to tell you a little about how they've grown. Maybe the, the one who was most interested in baseball has now turned his attention to trombone. I mean, you never can tell. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I like to do that even before we come into the atrium perhaps but then the, also what Anna said earlier about letting them have some time to walk around and see what they see that looks familiar and maybe another question I ask is and what do you see that you'd like to know about mm. yeah. and then when they come to sit after they've walked around and poked and things they can say oh well I saw the good shepherd or oh I, you know, I saw the Last Supper, or I saw this treasure box, and I'm really wondering what's in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those are like walk-in-the-door kinds of things. Right, which I think are really important. I mean, at least for me as an adult, I know whenever I've gone to formations or anything, I, I like I need to know where the bathroom is, right? Like, you orient right. yourself to the space, and once you know where the bathroom is, where can I get my water— what is the order right. of which you are doing this event today? Those kind of questions that you naturally need answered, even without realizing you need them answered, you kind of can settle after that. So by orienting the child at the very beginning, as soon as they enter the atrium, letting them know the things that are familiar, the things that are not, where the bathroom is, what is being asked of them, it helps them to then settle into the space. <laughs> 
And another tendency, uh, the tendency to work, even when they first come in, I think for some children that, that tendency is very strong. So having out uh, supplies to make a name tag, having supplies to to go ahead and, and arrange some flowers for the space, that sort of thing, so that there is something to do for those who are are needing, you know, something. Some kind of right work as of they the come hand. in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They get, I think they've read about like potting some flowers or arranging flowers, like right. you just said, or to, you know, because it, it gives them an investment in the space when they do that kind of stuff. Or or maybe mm-hmm. they can decorate the folder that's going to be for the, all of their work items that year, like some kind yes. of work of their hands. Yeah. This is also the best opportunity, I think, for allowing and expecting, really, the children who have already been in the space to take the lead, to let them show the other, the new children, you know, where the art supplies are kept. Maybe, oh, you know, where are the pencil sharpeners? Where are the things for taking care of plants? Those children that already are at home in the space, they start immediately to build community when they take leadership. Mm, That's a good idea. So for your first session, I know sometimes for level one, you kind of slowly work your way in with the kids, maybe a shorter session or smaller groups, or you're just meeting with one kid one-on-one, do you still need that kind of slow moving in with the second plain child? I don't find that, for the most part, necessary. Um, I mean, there's always exceptions to that, but I think because it the children are moving into that social plane, that plane of social development, that we actually can use that to our advantage while we are orienting the children into the space. Mm. Plus, if the children have been in level one, as as we have established, there's plenty of familiar work in the space that they can you know, walk around and look at and see, you know, see how, how's it different? How's it similar, but not maybe exactly the same and that sort of thing. One of the first things that I think that we should do with the children is establish ourselves as a community and by establishing some group norms and some ideas about what kind of space would we like to have? What kind of community do we want to be this this year? What kind of atrium do you want to have? And so to be able to do that in all together, I think is helpful. And you do that the very first session? Usually. Yeah. So what are some of the things that the kids tend to come up with for their list of how they want to live into this community together? Because it's their list, right? Like they are coming up with this isn't right. us, the adults, telling them the rules of the atrium. This is the children coming up with their list. Right. And we do this in both levels two and three. Level three gets a little more specific. But usually uh, we want it to be a kind atrium, hardworking. We want it to be peaceful. We want it to be fun. We want it to be a place where we can learn, where we can pray, you know, that sort of Mm -hmm. thing. And sometimes it does seem like they might be trying to tell you what they think you want to hear. Right. But when you really talk to them about it, it is what they want. And some children even will add to it and say, this is the only place I can, that I can really go to where I can choose my own work. Or this is the only place I can go to where there's where everybody's being peaceful with each other mm. and that sort of thing. I've had level three children say, I don't want it to be like school. Mm. And so you write that down on the list too. Well, I say, what do you not want it to be? You know, can we can we unpack that statement? Mm-hmm. What are you saying? You know, because it's is nine to 12, usually, right. um, that have said that. What do you mean by that? Assignments, being made to do work, that kind of thing. Yet they're really, they're asking for the atrium to be de-schooled, even if they don't have that, that language right. to call it. Yeah, I think even like, uh, the atrium being a place where they are respected. Right. On a deeper level, yeah. So then this list that they create, it is displayed in the atrium 
for the whole year. So then, so what kind of atrium do we want it to be? And we have a scribe who writes it down. And then how are we going to achieve this? So how do we keep a peaceful environment? We had talk about that. How do we keep a hardworking environment? How do we keep an environment? Where, how do we have an atrium that's not like school? You yeah, know, yeah. Um, and and then we talk. So we we talk about how we're going to do that. So with those youngest ones, we're going to be like, we're not going to interrupt each other. We're going to listen to each other when when you know we're talking that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So it really comes a, becomes a list of positive norms, you know, everything written in the positive. Mm. So if they say something negative, like, you know, don't raise your voice. Well, how could we make that a positive rather than what we're not going to do? How are we going to say what we are going to do? And we do. We write them down. And I, uh, I use a title for this piece of paper or poster sometimes my last group wanted a bigger one i i call it what will our habits be here our habits of being and so those are all really positive habits Mm -hmm. i like that you didn't call them rules i know i never call them rules i call them positive habits of being (laughs) And they that that language, Lynn, is 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 very kind of adjacent to the virtues. Yes, mm. it is. It is. Well, it gets their attention because it's a kind of a different way to say. You know, they're accustomed to rules, and in fact, they're very interested in rules. They're law and order people. Right. They like rules, and they would be really hard on one another if the, if we allowed them to be. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they they can make some really harsh consequences sometimes. <laughs> um, but by using that term, habits of being, uh, I you know I sometimes say, what does it mean? Our in our very being, this is like a part of who we are. How do we want to be? Hmm. It's kind of interesting, too, if children have been level one, one of the first things they'll say is, we will use quiet voices. <laughs> <laughs> Because they, because that's what something that they've a habit they've already picked up. Oh, and inter, our children always interrupt, you know, with the hand on the shoulder too. Mm. Yes, um, yes. So even you know, I have adults that come up to me that grew up in the atrium, and they'll come up and do that to me. Now. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Okay, so what about the celebrations at the beginning of the year? And level one at the beginning, either the first session or the second session, we tend to do enthronement of the Bible. Do you have that as well? Yes, absolutely. So um, just really, I like to think about it as um, celebrating God's presence with us Mm. in, in the atrium and for the whole year, you know, that we are just celebrating and honoring God's presence in the word and really just kicking our year off, you know, in a in such a positive and joyful way. Yeah. Yeah. So do you do that the very first session? Usually the first. Yeah. That yes. celebration. For both I just want to emphasize we're talking about level two and level three. We do an enthronement right. of the Bible, right? Yes. Right. Yes. right. So the the thing is I think we all have the freedom. Uh, There's not, you know, that you must do it the first time session. You might have, you know, it's according to your group. You might have a shorter session with your first session if it's, you know, just however your the structure of your community works. But I think, you know, it's just important that it's done in the beginning. Right. And again, that's that's part of the ritual of the atrium that the children know they're going to to have the celebration, the enthronement of the Bible. And then they're also going to do the great stories with either the history of the kingdom of God or the plan of God. We're going to do those, you know, right from the get go. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and do them both on the very first session, but we're going to, that's going to be our focus. And that does both of those, the celebration and the um, the presentation, mm-hmm. help to create that community and also helps to create the whole atmosphere of the atrium for the year to come. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
And it, what's beautiful about doing this with the level two and level three children compared to level one is those older kids can plan the celebration themselves. How do they want to do that? Right. It could be more part, more, more and more their work as the year goes on. Right. Yeah. Okay. So what about, do you need to have an atrium completely ready with all your level two or all your level three materials before you begin the year when you are working with a second plane child? I would say a big fat no. <laughs> I, I would say I sincerely hope not. <laughs> okay, so why? Speak into that. Uh, oh, I, wow. <laughs> well, I, I can say that in my own experience, uh, more probably in level three than in level two. Yes. I mean, I yeah. was... Like that stuff was hot off the presses. Yeah. <laughs> when I I would present new things as I got them ready. Yeah, right. But the th- the wonderful thing about the second pine child is their ability to remain with some things for a long time, and so you don't always need to rush right to the next thing. And there's a lot of work that comes out of the big works. Right. Uh, the work that comes out of the history of the kingdom and and that work certainly work that comes out of the plan of God. So and for either either place, there are also some transitional works that can also take some time. I've had children, even children that are returning to level two who still want to go back and do another altar pasting, the altar big altar collage. That can take a couple of weeks if they do it carefully. Mm -hmm. So I I don't think you have to be too concerned about that. And and they they sort of recognize that we are a bit more human, uh, and (laughs) you know (laughs) that in fact we are still working on it too. Mm -hmm. And like Lynn said, in level three, I really i th- I think that it's good when we ha- when you have a, a catechist new to level three who's setting up the level three environment that if we're if we're going to say that it's a three year continuum of work and honestly at what how long had you been doing this work when you realized in level three I can never get it all done in three years there's no way <laughs> it's supposed to be that way though so it's great <laughs> yes yes so it, it it's that way intentionally it's that way by design but when we're first beginning we just we feel like that the children are going to because we are we're kind of used to that we're programmed that way and so at some point we realize hey this is this is really not how it works in level 3 but if the catechist and or the catechist who are building the level 3 atrium can really take i think 3 years to build it it gives you that idea of how the how the presentations and the materials unfold Mm -hmm. over that time for the children. Mm -hmm. And when the children in level two or three, if you're building the atrium, then, then your children in your atrium are new to it as well. And to have the entire community walk in to a fully stocked atrium can be overwhelming. Yeah. Like, you know, we always say once you've had a, uh, a presentation on something, you're free to work with it. And you have, but you have then this whole room full of stuff and no one has had a presentation on it except for maybe some of the, of the bridge work or some of the transitional work. So really, I think if, it, if you're, if you're preparing your atrium for the first time, whether it's level two or level three you know just look at the parts of the materials that are going to be key to a beginning of the year experience so what would that be for level two it would be you know the history of the kingdom of god work you know having your prayer corner ready you could have all of the parts of the kingdom work and that you have had in level one Or in in level three, you would have the work with the history of the kingdom of God transition works. 
and then be working on that big plan of God and have that ready. But you know what? If you don't have the timeline ready that first year that you're doing level three, tell the story anyway. Mm. I mean, it is better to have that visual because it gives us something to, you know, to hook, to hang, you know, to be able to visually see the time as it's marching by and and that sort of thing. But, you know, when you're first starting and if you don't have it ready yet, rather than just not giving them anything, just tell it. Mm -hmm. I would add to this, Anna, uh, we need to be careful not to slide into a situation where we are giving things in a way that everybody's going to be working on the same thing at the same time. Mm-hmm. We, we do need to look around and think about, you, you've already made several good suggestions, the parables. I would say the maxims would be a really good one to have right. early, early on. The infancy narratives that they've already had, obviously, you may not get all of them done, but get some of them. I also think the pen maps. Uh, You want to have some of the things that are going to extend work from level one, but you want to have enough variety around the room that you will be able to have. They they like to work in groups, but you don't want them all sitting there trying to make a unity strip at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right. So you do have to have enough variety, depending on the size of your group, you'll have to think about, okay, do I have enough variety here that I can get some are working on prayer cards or some are making altar cards or, you know, that there's enough variety that they can begin to recognize that we're not all going to do the same. That's when it starts to look like school. Right. Right. It's when everything, everybody seems to be doing the same thing at the same time. And as Catechus depending on what your background is, I suppose, it's a temptation because it's easier to manage that everybody's kind of doing the same thing at the same time. So, you know, the irony of that, though, is, you know, we work really hard to make sure that we do have a variety of for them to do as follow-up work and and not only follow-up work, but to come in and, and work and, you know, to have a variety in our presentations as well. But that herd instinct from the level two or from the second plane one of those characteristics kicks in yes it's true and so you know we have you know one group of children making a a three moments chart and then another couple of children think well that looks fun but I think I would like to make one but I think I would like to make hey why don't we make one and let's let's see if we can get some foam board to make ours you know I'm just making that up but you know everybody's always you know it sparks an idea Mm -hmm. yes Yes. then another small group will want to do it and then another small group will get an idea of like well let's do out let's do something like that but let's not do it with that presentation let's do it with something else Mm -hmm. you know and before you know you look around you can just see how the over a course of one or two sessions, how the whole space has shifted. And they all have, or many of them at least, have taken on that herd mentality. And that is a place where, you know, oftentimes people talk about that herd mentality in a negative light. But this is a positive of when people see others doing something interesting, extension of an idea or or such that they want to do it, but they want to do it in a different way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how about interactions with the parent, especially at the beginning of the year, to really set your year up for success? How do you go about that? Well, I, I like to actually have a meeting with parents, an orientation meeting. And uh, again, it's helpful if I have some parents that have already been with me before. I like to talk to them about First of all, what they can expect from us about being on time, trying to come, you know, we're, we're going to show up every Sunday. I hope you will. Mm-hmm. And I will explain that when children miss, they miss more than just a lesson. They, they miss the, the ongoing growth of the community. And then they feel somewhat what distant 
when they come back in. So, yes, everybody has to miss occasionally, but I try to talk about attendance and about timeliness. I try to give them a little, a bit of an overview of what it is we're going to be looking at say from the beginning of the year till Christmas. And then I like to also say, oh, what, this is what you can expect from us and, and what you, we expect from you. Mm-hmm. So I try to have that, that conversation with parents up front. And one of the big questions in level two always, always, always is about first communion, mm-hmm. our first sacrament. Mm-hmm. And so before we can get sidetracked on that, I usually try in that orientation to announce what our plans are for that process briefly and to invite those parents who will be a part of that process to a different meeting. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, through the years, I've tried so many different things. And for many, many years, we had the first session be an informational session. Some years we've had sessions of orientation that were like drop-in where people could come. Honestly, now, if people ask for an orientation, I put the invitation out there if parents ask for that. I've actually even given orientations on Zoom with parents at work, you know. Mm -hmm. So meeting the parents where they are. Then I like to write about it. And we have a closed, we have a private Facebook page for our community. And we, you know, follow really strict norms about who can see the photos and that sort of thing. But oftentimes I'll take photos of various materials and and even share there you know what what are we doing with this what is the aim of this work and that sort of thing so I think there's value in all of these you know ideas and and in the end it's what works best with your community at any given time and sometimes it's you know not even just one or the other you know Sometimes with parents, it's all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like that you said to meet the parents where they're at. I think that's really important, especially because you don't know what's going on in the parent's physical life, but also in their spiritual life. Like it's very important for us to be extra pastoral when we're dealing with parents because it's very easy to turn adults off if they feel judged, if they feel accused, if they feel... Yes. Yeah. So just meeting parents where they're at, I think, is really important. I also find it's really helpful, especially because we start using terms in level two that the parent might never have heard of, like creation, redemption, parousia, to kind of talk whenever you're orienting the parent to the environment to show them kind of like what you were saying of what we will be potentially be going over this year or what we'll be sitting with this year, helping to them to be exposed to some of those terms so that when their child comes home and starts talking about parousia, the parent knows what they're talking about at least a little bit, right? I think it's very helpful. Or like the the term the maxims also is another one that comes to mind is very helpful. So I got this idea from Lynn very many years ago of of sending out a liturgical guide. You know, th- these are some of the themes that your child will be working with uh, or will be mm-hmm. exploring in the. You know, it's not it's not a uh, it's not a syllabus, but these are some of the uh, themes that your child will have the opportunity to be working with this coming liturgical season and that's also a place to unpack some words and then this is what you can do at home you know i think that's a really important part is inviting parents into a partnership yeah to recognize that you know we have promised as a community to accompany your child since their baptism but you were their primary guides and so our partnership yeah. here is to work with you and here are some things we're doing and these are some ways that you could potentially go deeper with your child at home i, I think that's an important thing to do to lift up the importance of their role as parents, not in a judging way, but in a positive way. 
they're doing that yeah. whether you know they're doing something whether they know it or not right and now we're showing them how they can tie it in exactly you know. even something as simple as for example with the history of the gifts i my little thing on what you can do is take a walk right yeah. you know like go out yeah. walking in nature and just spend some time enjoying the gifts that god has made yeah or an easy one I always think about is baptism. So you go home and talk about what you remember about their baptism or maybe pull out that baptismal candle that they got or just a way to be able to continue with the life of the atrium into the life of the greater community, I think is really beautiful. I like the I like the term partnership that you used in that because we are. It is a partnership between the whole church community in this commitment, like you said, of us all growing in our faith together from our baptism, right? Wow. It's the communal commitment. And we also have those beautiful resources, the parent pages Absolutely. that we have on our website that are so, so helpful. There's a plenty, plenty that have to do with the level two and level three child to help parents kind of learn a little bit about maybe the Our Father or, you know, the history of the kingdom of God that we were talking about or baptism or whatever. There's parent pages about all these different themes that we tap on in the atrium and then how to extend that into the domestic church, into the right. home. And so those can be certainly complement what you're doing on a personal level in your individual atria so that when parents see that, oh, this is bigger than yes. our parish. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Some, somebody else okay. is doing this work. And yeah. I think that creates a positive energy as well. Yeah, I agree. Well, a, a couple of years ago, maybe even it was before COVID, but about that time, maybe, we actually invited parents. We, in our orientation, we showed them the book, Joyful Journey, and Life in the Vine had just come out. Mm -hmm. And so we told them that if they wanted these books, we would order them for them. They had to sign up because we weren't going to just buy them without knowing they really wanted them. But you'd be surprised, especially for the level one people, Joyful Journey tended to be more popular, I think, because they just, they're just they just bringing their children, you know. But uh, we did invite them to, to look at Life in the Vine. And then we, we told them, you know, please come and talk to us. If anything in here sparks something in you and you want to have a conversation about it, let us know. That's a great idea. Those books were designed for parents. Right. So those are perfect resources to, to ask the parents if they want them. Yeah. They don't even know about them. So, yeah. Also, I find inviting parents into material making is another great way to get them in the atrium, a part of the community. Like, it can even be the cutting of all of the... The, the the earlier altar collage that we have in level two, you know, for the younger level two child where it's already all pre-cut. Like... That is a meticulous work. So having somebody do that. or we, I have found, though, that a lot of parents are very talented. Some um, are really good at painting or writing or sculpting or whatever. And they just, they want to be asked. So inviting parents into the material making part of what we do is is another beautiful way of living in community with the whole, mm -hmm. the whole family. Yeah. Well, is there anything else about the beginning of the atrium year for this second plain child that you want to lift up? Uh, one thing we haven't talked about as much, I think with level three, recent years, it's been a while now, but in relative recent years, we've learned that from Francesca that in the level three atrium, they would begin the year with doing either a meditation synthesis type meditation mm -hmm. on either the good shepherd or the true vine and they would just begin the year by recalling what have we come to know about jesus the good shepherd and and that that is just such a lovely way to begin as well and then another year doing the true vine the same way what have we come to know I also think it's important to note with the true vine that we look at the Good Shepherd as the primary parable of level one. And then we often say that the true vine is the parable for level two. But the true vine is also the parable for level three. Mm -hmm. It is the parable for the second plain child. And so, you know, just making sure, that too, that we are lifting up that 
particular parable alongside all of this cosmic education that we're doing with the history of the kingdom and the plan of God. And, the, you know, they start seeing, wow, this is a parable about that. But mm-hmm. once they start making those connections and the uh, unity and the vastness, for me, after having done level three for quite a while to to learn that it was you know, i loved it and and it certainly has uh, no pun intended it's it's bearing fruit um <laughs> <laughs> and i want to share this story a catechist a long time catechist just texted a few minutes ago and she's getting re- her son ready for college and this is a her son grew up in the in the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. And she said they're just at Walmart getting some final things for him to take. And he passed some artificial plants. And he started looking at them. And she said, oh, honey, we'll get you a plant, but let's get a live one. We'll just wait till we get to school and we'll go somewhere and get some things and we'll get you a live one. You don't want a plastic one. And he said, Oh, okay. He said, but what I really want is a true vine. So she she said, we can make that happen. She said, (laughs) and then she said she was reduced to a pool of tears right in the middle of the world. Oh, Oh, that poor mama heart. Yes. yes. (laughs) And I said, well, I'm reduced to tears reading your text. (laughs) Well, and I am taken right back to that first quote that says, the vital need for essentiality is no less strong in the older child. (laughs) Right. Even the child going to college. (laughs) Even the 18-year-old. That's right. Uh, No, I think that's really good, though, that you lifted that up, Anna, about the need for us to return back to that that vital need of the image of the good shepherd and the image of the true vine um, at the beginning of the year, because it's, it, it's one of those things that we spiral off of on all the other themes in the atrium can be referred back to those two parables. And so revisiting them one, one year and one, the next, I think is, is important for us to remember that that's part of our atrium year as well. Well, is there anything else that you guys want to lift up before we finish? God bless everybody. Thank you. Thank you both so much for sharing your wisdom with us. I always, always so appreciate you. Well, and I think it's just making us all very excited to begin another year. (laughs) Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Thank you for having (laughs) us. Yes, Carrie, and thank you for this ministry and uh, all that you do for all of us by having that. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. Check out our show notes. I have a link for you to check out all the parent pages that we were discussing in our conversation. There is such a good wealth of knowledge and resources there for you to share with your parents and how to really partner with them on this journey of their child and their whole family's spiritual growth. I'm also putting a link in our show notes to the books that we discussed and that really pertain to the second plain child. So we have The Religious Potential of the Child for the 6 to 12 year old, and we have Life in the Vine, The Joyful Journey Continues. Now this one, The Life in the Vine, was written really for parents, really for the information to be easily accessible. So that is a great resource for you to provide for your parents, just like Lynn was saying in our conversation today. So in our show notes, I put links there so that you can purchase those easily. I also put links to all the past episodes that Lynn and Anna have joined us on the podcast. We also have an episode about welcoming the child and it's specifically talking about level one. If you are preparing to be a level one catechist this year or a parent for a level one child, I highly encourage you to check out that episode. Don't forget that we also have the audio version of Religious Potential of the Child read by Rebecca White Savage available on Audible. And we would love for you to submit a listener question. So if you have any question about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd or something going on in your atrium that you would like one of our guests to answer for us, please check out our show notes for a link to how to submit a question. 
This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. If you would like to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or if you would like to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.